There are four types of fasting that you can rotate through and get different kinds of benefits depending on what you're after. We're going to talk about types of fasting that boost metabolic benefits and body composition. We're going to talk about another kind of fasting that you can rotate in and out of that's going to help you with cellular rejuvenation and overall recycling cells. Then we're going to talk about another kind of fasting that's specifically good for the gut. And then we're, lastly, we're going to talk about another kind of fasting that is very extreme, known as dry fasting. So this is your overall encyclopedia of the different kinds of fasting and how you can utilize them and how often you should be utilizing each and every one. Hey, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel. New videos coming out every Tuesday, every Friday, and every Sunday at 7 a.m. Pacific time. Also, hit that little bell button so you can turn on notifications so you can hop on whenever I do a live broadcast. All right, so let's talk about the first one. The first one is one you've heard of before, intermittent fasting. Now, intermittent fasting is doing shorter periods of fasting relatively frequently. So in this case, I'm talking about doing like a 16-hour fast with an 8-hour eating window or maybe an 18-hour fast with a 6-hour eating window or somewhere in that general ballpark. This is the kind of fast that you should be doing three to four times per week, hence the word intermittent fasting. Some people like to fast every single day, but honestly, I'm a proponent of just fasting three to four times per week so it maintains its effectiveness. So intermittent fasting is best for body composition. Sure, there are a multitude of other benefits when it comes down to brain energy, when it comes down to autophagy, and all kinds of things. But by and large, the standout benefit is body composition. So I want to reference a study that helps make some complete sense of this. This study was published in the Journal of Translational Medicine, and it took a look at 34 resistance-trained subjects. And what it wanted to measure was what happened when you compared subjects that were fasting, doing an intermittent fasting protocol, versus subjects that were not, that had the same amount of muscle, had the same amount of fat, and were eating roughly the same amount of food. Well, the results were pretty crazy. So what they did is they took these subjects and divided them into two groups. One group consumed their food at 1 p.m., at 4 p.m., and 8 p.m. This was the fasting group, intermittent fasting. The other group consumed their meals at 8 a.m., 1 p.m., and 8 p.m. So basically, they were eating standard meals throughout the course of the day, like a regular diet. Well, at the end of eight weeks, what they found was pretty crazy. They found that the fasting group that consumed the same amount of calories as the non-fasting group ended up having a 16% reduction in fat mass, and the non-fasting group only had a 2.8% reduction in fat mass. They also found that the fasting group had a small increase of 0.86 pounds when it came down to muscle, whereas the non-fasting group only had a 0.64% increase in non-fat mass. That's pretty darn cool. We burned fat and built muscle. But there's some additional things too. They also found that the fasting group had decreased levels of fasting insulin and also decreased levels of triglycerides, proving that the long-term effects were also there as well. So we know that intermittent fasting is good to do frequently. That's a lifestyle approach. This is the kind of thing that you do to change your body over time and the thing that you do to adopt a totally new style. But what about another type of fasting? What about a fasting that's more for cellular rejuvenation and for regeneration of cells and general health and longevity? Well, that's where we get into the second kind, which is prolonged fasting. Don't get prolonged fasting confused with intermittent fasting. Sure, they can both be used in conjunction of one another, but they're very, very different. Prolonged fasting is where you're fasting for like 24 hours to 72 hours, okay? And this is the type of fasting that you maybe wanna do once, maybe twice a month. You don't wanna be doing it once a week. It's a little too extreme and your calories will probably get too low. But the main benefit that we're looking at with prolonged fasting is coming from the autophagy effects. You've probably heard me talk about autophagy before and you've probably seen it floating around the internet. But autophagy is simply where your cells create specific membranes that go out and hunt old decrepit cells that we don't need anymore. It's basically our body's cell recycling system. And it's one of the coolest things that our bodies have the capability of doing. So the cells go out and they hunt old cells that don't need to be there anymore and they eat them for energy. So when you're fasting, when you're not eating, your cells are eating old cells for energy. Now this is easily measured through something known as autophagosomes. If we have more autophagosomes within the body, then we're in a higher state of autophagy. We're recycling more cells. Now here's the cool thing. With autophagy, when it occurs in the liver, we also increase lipolysis, which means we're improving fat burning. Lipolysis equals the utilization of fats for fuel and ultimately turning it into an oxidized form where we are burning it. So if we improve the efficiency of the liver by actually helping autophagy in the liver, we also improve fat burning. So don't get the wrong idea. Just because prolonged fasting is good for overall longevity doesn't mean that it's not good for fat burning too. Now there was one study that took a look at prolonged fasting and it found that at 24 hours, there was a 300% increase in autophagosomes. 
holy cow, that is a huge increase. And then after another 24 hours, there was another 30% increase. So at 48 hours, there was a 330% increase in autophagosomes. After 48 hours, it started to decline. Now, I love long, long fasting, but I'm trying to get you the most bang for the buck here so you don't waste your time. The benefits of fasting in a long term start to decline a little bit after 48 hours. So 24 to 48 hours is sort of your sweet spot. But there's another benefit, and a study over at University of Southern California found this really, really cool result. So you know of stem cells, right? Stem cells are what create new cells in our body. They stem new cells. Now, when it comes down to our immune system, if we can create new immune cells, our bodies can be ruthlessly efficient at staying healthy and fighting off illness. So at USC, they found that when you're fasting, you have a massive increase in stem cells. And it happens because you're killing off the old, dying white blood cells. This forces stem cell production to produce new white blood cells. New white blood cells attack disease. They keep illness out. But additionally, fasting for 24, 48, 72 hours had a huge benefit in decreasing and downregulating what is known as PKA. PKA is a gene, and it's a gene that needs to be turned off if we ever want to have stem cells produced. As we get older, we have more PKA. That's why we produce less stem cells and why we get kind of run down. We can't recover as well as we did when we were younger. So fasting turns off PKA so that stem cells can be released again. That is powerful. That's where it is so powerful with prolonged fasting when it comes down to rejuvenation and longevity and feeling young again. And that's exactly why I recommend doing that once or twice a month, but not really any more than that. The next one I want to talk about is a liquid fast. And this technically, according to a lot of people, wouldn't be really a fast. Metabolically, it's not a fast. But it's a liquid fast and it helps your digestive system. And I do it for that sole purpose. You see, when you do a liquid fast, you're still consuming liquids. You're still consuming water, you're still consuming coffee, you're still consuming tea, you're even consuming beverages that might have some calories. You might even consume a soda now and then if you really want to. But most of all, we're consuming things like broths. And I'm a huge proponent of bone broth. So you know that Kettle and Fire is probably the leading supplier of bone broth, and they're also a sponsor of this channel. So it makes sense that I mention them anyway when I'm talking about bone broth. But let's get down to the science of what happens when you're doing a liquid fast. And how often should you do one? See, liquid fasts are something that you can incorporate into your diet once a week or once every two weeks. Again, you can count it as one of your intermittent fasting days or not. I don't really care, but the fact is, if you give your gut a break once or twice every couple weeks, you're in a really good situation. And a lot of it has to do with the gelatin. You see, bone broth has gelatin in it. So when you consume this gelatin, it protects your gut lining and it actually helps support that mucosal layer. You see, when we're consuming a lot of sugars, we're consuming a lot of carbohydrates and foods in general, our gut gets worn down. And when our gut gets worn down, the mucosal layer starts to break apart, basically. It's called a leaky gut, and it's kind of over-marketed, so people don't usually believe it anymore. But essentially what happens is you're causing this inflammation in your gut, and it causes bacteria, and it causes food particles to get into your bloodstream that causes your immune system to go sky high, makes you feel run down. Taking care of your gut is important, and it will help you boost your fat loss if you support that mucosal layer. But the glycine and the gelatin that's in bone broth also helps balance out the gut microbiota. If we balance out the gut microbiota, we have the balance of the good bacteria that allows us to truly feel our best and truly metabolize food the way that we need to. But also, there's something called glycine, which is prevalent in bone broth. And this glycine has some very powerful effects on the body as well. You see, glycine stimulates hydrochloric acid, stomach acid which means it allows us to burn a little bit more of that food that we're actually consuming when it does come time. It also improves that gut motility. You see, gelatin and glycine combined modulate inflammation within the gut. So not only does it make our gut healthier, but it also helps us draw water into the gut. A little bit of passive diffusion goes a long way. Passive diffusion is where we draw some water into the gut, but not too much. And in this case, it adds just enough water to improve motility. So imagine your gut being really dry and things just not being able to move through, whether it's your upper intestine or your lower intestine. It's not a pretty thing to think about. So if you could add a little bit of motility and sort of condition your gut to move fluidly without inflammation, everything moves smoother and absorbs better when you do eat. That's why I'm a huge proponent of doing a bone broth fast once every week or two. It really just helps out a lot. Plus, we have the glutathione production. The glutathione production helps out in terms of master antioxidant capabilities within your body. So with this extra glutathione, our bodies are able to detox better in and of themselves. 
So make sure you check it out. And also as a bonus, just so you know, Kettle and Fire now has some other flavors that still won't technically break your liquid fast. Okay, they have like a miso flavor, which is super awesome. Don't be afraid because miso has a tiny bit of soy in it. Honestly, when it's organic and when it's sourced right, soy is very, very powerful. We just don't want too much of it. A little bit of phytoestrogen is okay. We just don't want too much. But anyway, it makes it a little bit more fun to do a bone broth fast when you're not just doing bone broth, but you actually have some cool flavors. So check them out in the description below and you can also get my discount on it so you can start participating in liquid fast too. Now, the next kind of fast that I want to talk about is the most extreme one. And this is one that you only need to be doing once every three to six months. Okay, honestly, you don't even need to be doing it. It's extreme, but I wanna put it out here because it is a true type of fasting. It's called dry fasting. And dry fasting is where you don't consume any food or water for roughly 20 to 24 hours. That's pretty intense. Now there's a soft dry fast and a hard dry fast. A soft dry fast is where you're still brushing your teeth and you might still wash your hands and do some other things where you're gonna absorb water, but a true hard fast is where you totally abstain from even touching water. I know that sounds kind of sketchy because you wouldn't be taking a shower, but you know, that's really the way it rolls. Soft fast or hard fast. But it has been proven that one day of dry fasting is equivalent to three days of overall fasting. Why is that? Well, it's simply because when you deprive your body of water, it has to pull water from other cells. It has to truly go into that survival of the fittest mode as much as it possibly can. Any of those cells that are even the slightest bit weak, they die off and they draw water out of them. And the powerful cells draw the water out of those cells so that they can thrive and get even stronger. So you're running on a bare minimum, but you're running on a bare minimum with the most ruthlessly efficient, powerful cells in your body that you could possibly imagine. The other thing we have to factor in with dry fasting is you cannot have inflammation if you don't have water. So you have massive modulation of inflammation that occurs, even if it's short term. This might be what you need to feel good, to get up and get going and get over that hump that you need to get over. But the cool, cool thing about the extreme case of dry fasting is what it does in terms of fat loss. You see, we have to remember what makes fat. Fat has hydrogen in it, okay? What makes water? Hydrogen and oxygen. So think about this. If you're deprived of water, you're not consuming water, what is your body gonna do to create water? It's gonna literally create its own water from oxygen that you breathe and fat cells that have hydrogen. And it's gonna combine the oxygen you breathe with the hydrogen that it extracts from fat and it makes molecular water that your body can now use. You just created water from fat. That sounds like a pretty awesome trade-off. I will trade body fat for water any day of the week, you name it. So this is what really makes it powerful when it comes to dry fasting, is the ability to recycle cells with a vengeance, the ability to totally zap your fat stores, but we also have to factor in all the other metabolic benefits, especially when it comes down to diseases and potentially even cancer. Here's the full disclaimer though. Dry fasting is extreme, okay? Make sure you talk with a doctor or talk with a professional before you embark on it. And that's why I recommend only doing it every three to six months, even if you're someone that feels like you're experienced with fasting. You shouldn't do it all that often and you should make sure that you're ready for it. So there you have it. Intermittent fasting, prolonged fasting, liquid fasting, and the extreme dry fasting. Make sure that you share this video with your friends so that they know the different kinds of fasting and what they can have in their arsenal. And make sure that you help benefit this channel and support all the videos that we produce by checking out Kettle and Fire down below in the description. I'll see you soon.